Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Thanks to care.com for sponsoring today's episode of the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Care.com is the world's largest digital marketplace for finding and managing all kinds of family care, and it's especially good for helping families find high-quality senior care for their loved ones. Save 30% off a Care.com premium membership when you subscribe by going to care.com slash yours truly. And we'll have more to tell you about today's sponsor after the program. Now, it's time for today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date is November the 6th, 1960, and this is The Super Salesman Matter. Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Well, greetings, Master. Now, what's that supposed to mean? Oh, just being polite when I see a nice fat commission about to come my way. You know something, you Maybe it could involve a sizable commission. Ah, uh, the sound of sweet music wafts to my ears. Who, what, when, where, and why, Pat? Uh, only answer to them, Johnny. All right. What? What, where? Ever hear of the Rochemont necklace? I never. Well, you should have. But come on over to my office. I'll tell you about it. Missing? That's right, missing. From where? I'll tell you about it. Oh, it's a word. I mean, unless it's pretty valuable, What's there's the no difference. Sense? Your commission may be a sizable one. How much, Pat? Come on over. How much? Well... Insured for exactly three hundred and twenty-one thousand. What? That's right, three hundred and twenty-one thousand. Okay, baby, I'm on my ever-loving way. <laughs> CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investor. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the super salesman matter. As always, the promise of a big commission did sound like sweet music to me. So, expense account item one is a buck and a quarter for cab to the Office of Universal Adjustment in the Spear building down on the square where Pat was waiting for him. Oh, come in. Sit down and listen, Johnny. Sure, sure, Pat. Right ahead. Well, the Rochemont necklace. Part of some old crown jewels or something came over from Paris a few years ago. Huh? The whole collection was worth a couple of million dollars. <sighs> now, various parts of it were sold to various people in various parts of the country. But the ruby and diamond necklace went to Mrs. Liza Rochemont. Now, she's a wealthy widow living out on the edge of town. Mm-hmm. Except when she was away in Florida, California, Europe, wherever, when she put it in a vault at the bank, she kept it in a wall safe at her home, a safe to which she alone has the combination, and nobody's ever broken into it. You're sure of that? I'm sure. There's an automatic device that would show it. Was it you aware that price is not good jewelry? Oh, quite often. Which is why she often had it cleaned and the stones checked in the settings. Go cool. on. So, a couple of days ago, she handed it over to that jeweler in the new building just across the square there. Hey, you see the shop? Mm-hmm. Parker? Mm-hmm. Peyton Parker. Oh, uh, seems to me she'd pick one of the big ones, one of the old-time firms, or uh, send it down to New York to Tiffany's or Cartier or someone like that. After all, well, that's is... exactly what her insurance man, Tim Pringle, uh, you know him, Surety Mutual? Oh, sure. Yeah, well, Tim told her this morning when he found out what's happened. What's happened? Clayton Parker called her up in the middle of the night then barged in on her, looking like he'd seen a ghost or two. He laid the necklace in her lap and promptly fainted away. Parker? Parker. And? And when he came to, with the help of a little brandy, he shakily told her that her necklace, instead of the genuine article worth over 300 Gs, was faced with a fake. You are kidding. No. She took it over to Wilson Brothers, regular dealer. They told her Parker was right, so she fainted. 
Well, now, look. Well, when she came to, she notified Tim Pringle. He notified me. I called you. That is, after I took time out for a little thinking about it. Yeah? A Universal Adjustment Bureau serves a lot of companies. I know. All over the country. I know. We get reports on every client company's problem. So? Well, something rang a bell. I went through the file. Johnny, this very same kind of thing happened back in 56 out in Chicago, down in Philadelphia, that was in 59. Huh? And in each case, the jeweler who discovered the switch answered the description of Mr. Clayton W. Parker. Oh, oh, oh. Has anybody been through Parker's shop? Uh, well, now, Johnny, we've got a little problem there. Problem? Like what? Well, if Tim Prickle openly sticks the police or even a private investigator on the park. Well, uh, yeah, I see what you mean. Now, if Tim were to pull a boo-boo, make a wrong charge against his own new client... So, what am I supposed to do? Bust into Parker's shop some dark night, blow his safe, maybe? Well, Johnny, uh, he does not have a burglar alarm in that little shop of his. Nor on the safe inside. So what? And it is easily accessible from a dark alley out in the back. Oh, of the no, no, no. Oh, wait a minute. Well, are you... Are you asking me? Are you oh, suggesting Oh, of course I... not, Johnny. I'm not asking a thing. What kind of a company do you think this is? Well, well don't mean, be ridiculous. Honest. However, if somebody were to find the genuine necklace in Parker's safe, someone that is unknown to us, I, uh... What did you say your name is? I didn't. And you're... What's it to you? Okay. Okay. Item two, a hundred bucks to a man named Fingers J. Mc... But let's leave his last name out of this. I may have use for his delicate touch again sometime. Well, getting into the back of Parker's store that night was a cinch. And once inside, we could see why he didn't bother with much protection. His stock was small, and most of it was novelty stuff. And he must have been a super salesman to get hold of Mrs. Rochemont's valuable necklace. If it was the real one that he took in for cleaning. While Fingers worked on the old-fashioned safe, I went over the store with a fine-tooth comb. Wearing gloves, of course. Ah, no sign of the necklace anywhere, including the safe. So I helped Fingers out of the back window we'd opened, sent him on his way, made a careful check to be sure the place looked the same as it had before, then proceeded to hoist myself out of the window. Ah. Now, let's see if I can get this thing closed again. Huh? Oh, no. Now, now wait a minute. Don't... Yeah. And this will keep you here. Oh. Help! Listen carefully. Get the picture. Timber, needed for thousands upon thousands of new houses, is needlessly destroyed. Watersheds supplying vitally needed water for industry and life itself are laid waste. Wildlife is cruelly killed, their habitats ruined for many years to come. Sorely needed outdoor recreational areas are burned black. Homes are leveled to the ground and human lives destroyed. And what causes this terrible destruction, this tragic loss? It can be as tiny a thing as one paper match. Ninety percent of our forest fires are caused by people. People who are careless for just one fatal instance with their cigarettes, matches, campfires. Every American, every one of us, man, woman, or child, is a potential firebug. It takes only a moment's carelessness or thoughtlessness to set fire loose in the forest. Let's all observe the simple common sense rules of forest fire protection. Remember, only you can prevent forest fire. And now, act any dollar. <laughs> How I managed to get back up on my feet and out of that alley before the police arrived, I'm not quite sure. But I somehow did. I ran a couple of blocks through some other alleys and then playing drunk, which wasn't hard after the covenant that I grabbed a taxi. That's item three, a buck and a half. I went back to my apartment, had a couple of stiff drinks, a couple of aspirins, and soaked my aching head with a wet towel. And after a good night's rest, I was all set to call Pat McCracken and tell him to go jump into the nearest lake. Until I remembered that officially he'd have nothing to do with all this. And then I did some thinking. If what Pat had told me was true, only two people could possibly have substituted a phony for the Rochemont necklace. The wealthy Mrs. Rochemont herself, of course. Uh, this new small-time jeweler, this Clayton Parker. 
But it wasn't in the store. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe hidden around his home someplace. Well, I could try. In the meantime, hope he hadn't recognized me in that alley. No doubt he'd be in a shop this morning. And if he was married. Hmm. Expense account item four, five dollars for a handful of business cards at the shop of a small printer. Item five, seventy nine ninety five for a vacuum cleaner, one of the tank type jobs with all the accessories. And I managed to grab a stack of literature on it. Item six, two and a quarter to pawn shop for a beat up fiber soup case. The business cards went into my pocket, the vacuum cleaner went into the back seat of my car, which luckily was badly in need of a wash job, but kind of poorly. The accessories and literature went into the suitcase, then into the back also. Then I crossed my fingers and took off. Now, wait a minute. Yes? Did you see that sign over the doorbell? No salesman solicited. Oh, well, of course. Well. But I came in answer to the coupon you mailed, asking for more information in the uh, free demonstration. Coupon? Oh, yeah. My, uh, my name is, uh, well, it's my car. Now, look. No obligation to buy, you know. None whatsoever. Yeah, I'm, I'm... Look, this is some kind of... James Dakin, sales engineer... And a national vacuum cleaner, sir. Yes, ma'am. What the hell, engineer? You really want to know? Huh? Uh-huh. Well, it's it's just a glorified name for an ordinary salesman. Well, you're a pretty glorified kind of guy to have to be going around pounding doorbells, Jimmy. Well, I've got to make a living. Yes, you do all right, too. A beautiful, lonesome, long-suffering housewife. See a good-looking guy like you at the door and pop off to work somewhere. You... Let me do all right. Oh, oh now, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, you should see some of those lovely, lonely housewives you're talking about. Uh, no makeup, hair still up in curlers, a pair of dirty bedroom slippers, chewed up by family pets. What? Yeah, yeah, all decked out in a sloppy house go with an old <laughs> apron full of soap suds from the breakfast dishes. <laughs> oh, oh, what a picture. Yeah, and maybe even kind of hung over from the night before. Oh, you mean that's what you usually run into? Oh, run away from. Are you cute, Billy? And uh, that's why it's such a relief to be met by somebody like you. I mean, uh... Well, that is. Uh, well, hmm. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. I I mean, well, I I mean, I brought the cleaner around to give you the demonstration you asked for when you sent in the coupon. Are you kidding, Jimmy? I didn't send in any coupon. Oh, but you must have. Whoa! Would you like me to go get my list out of the car? Uh. Uh-uh. Oh, because if you hadn't sent in a coupon, and I, I wouldn't. I hate to do you out of commission. But I sure don't need to buy another vacuum. Uh, I'm sorry. Good uh, luck. But I wasn't going to send you one. What? Oh, no. No, no. They're, they're sold only in the stores. I, I simply get paid for the free home demonstration. Oh? So just let me come in and show you how it works, huh? Then you can fill out the card saying you have had a demonstration and... Listen, Mr. Parker. Yeah, it's in... my name's Gloria. Well, look, things... Well, things have been kind of tough. And if I, if I told my quota this week... Well, well, look, I'll do the whole house for you, and no obligation, no obligation whatsoever. Well, Mrs. Parker? Oh, I mean, if my husband should ever know that I... He doesn't like people in here while he's out, but... Well... Oh, come on in. Oh. And after all, if you have to work so hard, maybe you could use a little drink, huh? Come on. Just to make the demonstration. Sure. Come on in. Oh, not just a minute. I'm a man of 
high principles. I had a job. Which is to say that as soon as I got inside, I unpacked the equipment, hooked it up, and went to work vacuum cleaning the whole house. And I'll tell you this. I should have studied the directions a little more carefully uh, before trying this crazy stunt. Or maybe made a few practice swings through my own apartment. Now, modern appliances notwithstanding, I now have a great deal of sympathy for the American housewife. I mean, that living room was huge, and so was the dining room. But I, uh, I didn't want to be obvious by heading into the study first. The study where her husband's desk would be, and where, if I were lucky, she wouldn't leave me alone for a second. Oh, come on, Jimmy, isn't that enough? No, got to finish the job. I promised I'd clean the whole place, and I'll do it. Uh... Why don't you just sit down, relax, and read a book or something? What about that little drink I promised you? We could have it right here in the den. Hey, look, I know. While you're breaking out the bottle, some ice and soda. Ice and soda. Yes, this will be fine. Suits me, too. See? We have the same taste. Yeah, well, while you're getting it, I'll finish up the study here, then we can sit down and relax a minute before I start. Relax, to rest, uh... huh? What? <laughs> uh, what did you say? Nothing. Hmm? Well, I'll go get the drink. Yeah. Still keeping the vacuum cleaner going, I made a dive for the desk. Top drawer and two on the side had only the usual junk in them. But the third one down had a small lock on it. By stepping on the handle, I was able to spring it. And there inside, the small black metal box. Yeah, the Rochemont necklace. And even my untrained eyes told me this was no fake. But I couldn't very well leave it there. And what if Gloria Parker knew about this? What if she suspected that my lousy cleaning job was just an excuse? Oh, that phone right there on the desk nearly scared me out of a year's growth. But it was the only phone in the house. Oh, no, it quit in mid-ring. Yeah, she must have picked up an extension. And that gave me time to close the drawer again and finish up my cleaning job before she came back into the study. When she did, instead of a couple of drinks in her hand, she carried one of those interesting little devices made out of blue steel. Okay, baby, that's enough. Huh? That's right. Now, why don't you just put up your hands over your head? Johnny. Johnny? That's right. Johnny Dump. Are you one of those people who are always on the go? Like you, our CBS newsmen are on the move all the time, too. Always in the direction of the biggest news developments of the day. Their own busy schedules give them a practical understanding of the value listeners put upon their services. They know you rely on them for accuracy at all times. And they have a first-hand appreciation of the importance of clarity and brevity as well. That all of these standards are kept in mind by our highly skilled, highly experienced newsmen is demonstrated over and over again in the news broadcasts you hear on CBS radio. The busier you are, the more you'll appreciate the efforts of our CBS news staff. These men offer you a direct link with history day by day. But more than that, they do their job with full regard for your busy schedule. They keep you fully informed with no waste of time, no waste of words. For accuracy, brevity, and clarity in news reports, for news at frequent intervals at the most convenient times, Keep tuned to CBS Radio every day. Now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Super Salesman Matter. Pretty smart, huh? Making like a vacuum cleaner salesman to get in here. Now, why don't you put that thing down? Oh, no. But you should have been smarter and listened in when the phone rang, Johnny. That was Clayton, my husband. Thought you might come here. You call me Johnny, Miss Parker. That's right. Johnny Dollar, the famous dick. You stupid. You think Clay didn't recognize you when he found out you'd broke into his store last night? Oh? Then why didn't the police pick me up this morning? You think he's dumb? Police find out you were checking on him. They might think he had something to do with that phony necklace that... Well, that... That what, Miss Parker? Uh, You know, that... Rich Mrs. Rochemont tried to pass on to him for cleaning. <laughs> she didn't know it was a phony. Is that his story? Anybody going to prove otherwise? Maybe. Oh, no, maybe, Johnny. But if you've got some crazy ideas, well, I don't think anybody's going to hear them. Because when Clay gets here... Ideas? Uh, what? 
What if I have some proof? I don't give me any of that kind, huh? No, wait. Maybe while I was out there, don't move. Now, oh, still what? You got no proof of anything. All right, now listen. Put down that gun for a minute. Oh, Let me no, tell you. No, you don't. And if you don't think I won't use it, you better look up my record. Gloria. Shut up. You. Well, you realize what you're letting yourself in for, don't you? You realize what you've already got yourself in for, Johnny Boy? Now sit down. Go on, sit down there. Sure. And while you're waiting, Johnny, maybe you'd better pray. Good work, Lori. Sure, okay. Cubs are leading in the sheep to the slaughter. And why'd you let him in here in the first place? Even if you didn't know who he was. Are you kidding? What do you mean, Dolly? Well, if you could have seen the open arm welcome I got on the strength of batting my nice brown eyes at her a couple of times. What? Sure. You don't keep very close tabs on her when you're out of the house, do you, Parker? Don't listen to him, Clay. He's lying. He's trying to trick you, make you drop your guard. That's right. And it won't work, Dollar. Yeah. Well, okay, I tried. So, now you can call in the police to pick me up. The police? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Why do you think I didn't call them in last night? Because they don't know you're on this case. You sure that? You trying to tell me they go for breaking and entering my shop? They or that insurance company of yours? In the hopes that maybe you'd find that uh, pretty little necklace? A necklace? It's all right, Clay. The drawer is still locked. Yeah. Yeah, I see. So you admit that you substituted that pony. Well? Keep that gun on him, Gloria, while I make sure it's still okay. Hey, don't worry. He didn't have a chance to look for it. Even if he'd known where to look. Up until you called, I kept him busy. I kept the great Johnny Dollar busy pushing a vest. No! It isn't here! All right, Dollar. Where is it? Give me the gun, Gloria. Sure. Now frisk him. Yeah, sure. Well? Well, has he got it? Um, would you like me to strip for you? Shut up. Perfectly willing to. Shut up! Not on him. Is anybody else in this house? No, Clay. And I only left him alone in this room for... Hear that. And shoot him down if he makes one move. Don't worry. He turned the room upside down, looked in and around and under everything. Even outside the windows. He made me strip of my shorts and went through every inch of my clothes. Nothing. It isn't here. Glory, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Well, then, if you don't mind, uh, I'll get dressed and leave you two to figure out what might have happened. Dollar, you don't leave this room alive. That's right, Clay. Kill him. Yeah. Now, Dollar. Parker. Yeah. Now. What? Police! Yeah. Well, they don't get... report to me that you'd found that uh, uh, that thing and his is, well, in wherever you were last night. Uh, um, please go on. <laughs> yes. Well, when I saw Parker, from my office window, they saw him tear out of a shop a few minutes ago and burn rubber heading out in this direction. Well, uh, obvious. So. So thanks. Yeah, thanks, Pat. And uh, would you like to see the necklace? Somewhere inside this vacuum cleaner I didn't sell. Parker is dead. His wife yammered all over the place in the hope of getting off easy. Optimus. So that's that. Expense account total one eighty nine ninety five. Oh, and by all means, don't forget my commission on something over three hundred and twenty grand. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Hi, this is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site where we put out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. In a moment, I'll get into my thoughts on today's episodes as well as read some of your comments and feedback. But before we do, I'd like to let you know a little about Care.com. Care.com is the world's largest digital marketplace for finding and managing all kinds of family care, and it's especially good for helping families find high-quality senior care for their loved ones. You're able to find the best local caregivers for your family needs. You can browse caregivers for a wide variety of purposes, including transportation, pet care, tutors, and senior care. While Care.com does not employ, endorse, or match caregivers with families, it provides you access to tools on its digital marketplace to help you find a caregiver, such as background checks, as well as reviews with its premium membership. It's really easy and convenient to use. You can go right to the website and start searching for free with the basic service. And then with the upgraded premium service, you can you can set up interviews, book, and easily pay your caregivers all in one place. Care.com is especially good at finding help that your aging parents may need to stay independent at home. You can find exactly the help that they need, whether it's just help with meals, errands, or housekeeping. And switching from care agencies to in-home care can cut your costs by as much as 50%. One service that really stood out to me on the website are just the number of caregivers available to run errands, which can be something really nice to have available right after a, a surgery, or if you're just going through a spell where it's really difficult to get to the store, whether you're thinking about it for your parents or if you're living on your own. I know that many of these transportation services um, would have come in handy during a period where I had dental surgery and we were new to the area. And so I was not able to drive and Andrea didn't quite have her license yet. The services provided by Care.com are definitely something to think about as our population continues to age. Every day, 10,000 baby boomers hit retirement age or turn 65. And about 13% of the U.S. population is age 65 or older, and that number is expected to double by 2050. Care.com has a special offer for our listeners. Go to care.com slash yours truly to get 30% off a premium membership when you subscribe. That's care.com slash yours truly. Thanks again to Care.com for supporting this podcast and bringing you today's episode. And now, regarding that episode, this was a pretty fun episode. Even if it does have Pat McCracken given a Mission Impossible style, if you are caught, the company will deny all knowledge of your actions sort of setup. This was probably Johnny's most fun and interesting undercover jobs. I would wonder why Jeweler would recognize Johnny Dollar just because he's famous for being on the radio. Being on the radio doesn't lend itself to facial recognition. Though I think there have been a few references to people like recognizing Johnny's picture from other locations. And I guess I could see if you're a thief, uh, you probably have an eye out for the world's most famous insurance investigator. Now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and uh, Bill says, How many or more episodes before the end of the Bob Bailey era? I'm guessing three or four. This was, of course, in regards to the unworthy kin matter, and at that point, there were five episodes left. But after today, there are actually only three episodes. So in four weeks, we'll actually be beginning the Bob Redick era on uh, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. So just a heads up, keep it in mind we're nearing the end of what's been a really great run of episodes, and certainly I'll have my thoughts on the Bailey era when we reach the end. If you have some thoughts you'd like to uh, share and be read on that episode, be sure and e email them to me, uh, box13 at greatdetectives.net. 
Uh, but that will do it for today. Uh, if you do uh, have a comment, uh, you can send it to us by email. Uh, check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash radio detectives. And then there is our ever growing YouTube archive, youtube.greatdetectives.net. Join us back here tomorrow for Dragnet. And then uh, next Tuesday, The Judge. And next Friday, we'll be back with another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.